And here we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52, which is just on the east side of Jefferson County, Missouri, or we say Jeff Como. Good to be with you today. Pastor Mike here. I'm online and I am live with you all today. I know it's Woden's Day. Uh, tomorrow we have a little field trip. We have several families that group together here. Uh, at Bethel Homeschool Families and things like that, and uh, we like to do little activities, and I get, I get dragged along on these things. Tomorrow, I have to take, I, my wife said I can't get out of it. I have to take these kids to a St. Louis Cardinal baseball game tomorrow. <laughs> Man. I don't, People who do that should be arrested. Yeah, that's what I'm saying to you. Uh, we're going to pick up, and so I won't be here tomorrow, so that's why I'm doing a live broadcast today. Uh, Michael said that he would probably rebroadcast this again tomorrow live if you wanted to see it again. Um, let me run through some things very quickly, and then we'll pick up where we left off yesterday, dealing with the cell and amino acids and base pairs and the number four and all of this stuff. But let me mention this today. There is an article that came out. Uh, an email was sent to me, an American Family Association Action Alert, and it talks about what's coming up this Friday in most public schools. And let me just remind you of something that um, I said, Fisher Ames, a man by the name of Fisher Ames, who was the guy who wrote the language of... Uh, what is it, the Fourth Amendment? Congress shall enact no law establishing a religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And modern-day jurist scholars have used that to say there should be a separation of church and state, which there is not a separation of religion and state. There just is a growing separation of Christianity and state in America. But they're embracing all these other religions, including in the public school system. Well, they will force kids to go to a Muslim mosque and put on the garb and pray toward Mecca. They will do this as a field trip. They're not separating from religion. They're separating from Bible Christianity. Fisher Ames, just so that you know how he thought, he said that the Bible should be taught in all of our public schools. He said there's no, there is no greater example of the English language than what's in the King James Bible. And he said everything that children need to know would be in the Bible. He said we should be teaching the Bible in our public schools. He didn't think that we should separate Christianity from the state. He didn't think that. He just said Congress shall not establish a state religion nor should it prohibit our free exercise of our religion. Coming up this Friday in most, if not all, public schools, maybe even some private ones, maybe even some quote-unquote Christian schools, is a day of silence. They did this, they've been doing this for several years. This is the um, Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network. Um, on this day, thousands of high school Public high schools and increasing number of middle schools will allow students to remain silent throughout an entire day, even during instructional time, to promote their social political goals. Um, I have read somewhere that, uh, and this is to promote bacon, gravy, lettuce, and tomato people. Um, this is to promote that sort of abomination in our public schools. And I read somewhere, I wish I could find it. Maybe, so, maybe it's not true. But someone was calling for gays and lesbians in public schools to act out in the public school. I don't even want to know what that means, but I think I know what it means. But that's what they're telling them to do. If your child is in public school, I think you've got time to do this. Go to the nearest t-shirt shop. Make for your children a t-shirt with Bible verses like Romans chapter 1. Um, and uh, what was it the other place where it's, the Bible says it is abomination for a man to lie carnally with another man. And send your kid to school with, t with a t-shirt on. 
And I will tell you this. I called the public school that Matthew was going to several years ago, and I asked them, if my son shows up tomorrow on the day of silence wearing a T-shirt with Bible verses on it, you're going to throw him out? You're going to make him take the T-shirt off? And she, the principal said, no, he has a right to his freedom of speech. And I said, okay. And, uh, but anyway, that's what's coming up, and, and just kind of be on the lookout for that, all right? Uh, here is something to me that's ex- I, I like stuff like this. Um, when it comes to space and rockets and exploration and wanting to know what's out there, there is a spacecraft headed toward Pluto. Poor Pluto, who got kicked out of the line of planets. I think it should still be in there, but other people don't. The NASA's New Horizon spacecraft has acquired its first color picture of Pluto. And if you have not seen this, get ready. This is absolutely stunning. This is the New Horizon spacecraft. It's going to be approaching Pluto in about three months. But it took the first ever high-resolution color picture of Pluto. Be ready to be stunned. Startled. Ready? <laughs> I couldn't pass that up. Anyway, here's a couple more things very quickly. We're going to get right into it. You, you be ready. Be ready. We're going to talk some more about DNA and the Bible and how they're interrelated and how one works exactly like the other. You're, you're just going to, you're going to love this. All right. I appreciate the comments of those of you commented yesterday about yesterday's broadcast. Um, you seem to enjoy it and I hope that it works just as well today. Scientists, listen to this. Scientists create man-made DNA. Now let me tell you this. As far as what I know, that's a lie. It's a lie. Man-made DNA does not exist. There is only God-made DNA and what they do is they copy it and then rearrange the base pairs. And I'll explain. If you don't know what that is, I'll explain it here in a little bit. Uh, but they create man-made DNA that mimics killer diseases. Now, there's just something, just something about this that doesn't feel right to me. They created man-made diseases DNA. Then they inject them into patients to create immunity. I, I don't like this. I think it's a bad idea. I've seen the movies where this doesn't turn out very good at all. Scientists have discovered how to, how to create man-made artificial DNA strands that mimic deadly diseases such as the flu, Ebola, cancer, and HIV. By the way, as part of my pre-surgery uh, examination, I had some blood work done. If you remember, I tweeted this a few weeks ago. My blood work, I'm fairly healthy. My, my A1C, which measures, um, I, didn't know, I didn't know that your body kept a record of blood sugar levels. For a limited time, like five or six months. I didn't know that, but it, that your body keeps a record of blood sugar levels. It's called the A1C test. And I'm just going, that's absolutely amazing. But my A1C was good. It's down at the level of someone who doesn't have diabetes. I still have diabetes, but I'm keeping it under control. Uh, cholesterol was fine and everything like that, but they did test my blood for this, and it come back that I am KJV positive, which means that I'll live forever. Amen. Um, anyway, they created this. They're gonna they're gonna be able to cure these diseases. That's what they think. The researchers claim that the visionary. I want you to think about that. The visionary treatments. It starts in the imagination of man. This is where they concoct all this stuff. What if? What if we could do this? What if we did this? What if we did that? Uh, we had some visitors from Holland several years ago, John and Marka. They wanted me to marry them. They already had a, a civil ceremony in Europe, and they had a church ceremony here. It was awesome. But he spent a week here in America, and we were talking about the difference between us and the Dutch. And um, 
one, one of the things I, I said to him, I said, John, you know, here in America, we have an expression called going Dutch. And he cocked his head like that and looked at me. And I said, it, what it means is, is that if, if you invite several people out for lunch or dinner or whatever, and you say, We're, we'll just go Dutch on this one or Dutch treat or whatever, what that means is, is that not one person's going to foot the bill for everybody. Everybody has to pay their own bill at the restaurant. And um, he said, I think I know what that came from. I said, where? He said, uh, do you know how copper wire was invented? I said, no. He said, two Dutchmen fighting over a penny. Now, I thought it was pretty good. But he said, he said in Holland, in the Netherlands, he said, we've, we've been under this social conditioning. And he said, our people are just different is what they are. And he said, Holland Dutch people are are sort of non-adventurous. They're not very um, inquisitive. They don't like to take risks. And, and Dutch will look at something and say, can we do this? That's what he said. Can we do this? And, I, and immediately I said, Americans are different, John. I said, Americans are Dutch people and British people and French people and Spanish people and all other kind of people that decided to say, what if I went to America? What if I got on a boat and risked everything and left home and went to a place that I've never been before? What if I did that? I said, that's what America is full of. And I said, Americans don't ever ask, can we do this? Americans ask, how can we do this? That has brought about uh, some tremendous innovation over the years, but it also has, is right now bringing out some very dangerous things. So they're not asking the question, can we do this? They're asking the question, how can we do this? And it starts in the imagination. And so anyway, um, the, the, the visionary treatments could be the key to defeating these killer diseases. In fact, human trials have already begun and results are said to be promising. The Boston News Times reports that the treatments work by injecting patients with man-made DNA. Who is the underpaid test subject who lines up and says, what, you guys just made that? Yeah, put that in me. Let's see if it works. Who is this? Who is this? Who is this guy who apparently has nothing else to do in his life except take experimental injections that nobody knows in the world what's going to happen once it goes in there? Um, it, it's kind of, to me. It's kind of like the first guy who decides that bathroom chemicals, uh, propane gas cold medicine, and all sorts of other poisons can be cooked together into a concoction to make methamphetamine. Who's the, who's the idiot that's standing there saying, let me try that. Let me try that. I, let me try. I want to be the first one to take these household poisons and inject this in my bloodstream. I want to do this. I don't get it. Anyway, the, this initiates the, an immune response to the disease, enabling the immune system to recognize and eliminate the disease threat if exposed. The treatment works. Have you not seen uh, I Am Legend? Have you not seen that movie? I've seen that movie. It turns out bad. Everybody turns into brain-sucking zombies because a new DNA-type treatment has been launched and it cures everybody of cancer, but it turns them into vampire zombies. The treatment works by teaching the immune system to recognize the specific protein found in the specific disease and eliminate it before it sickens the patient. Now, I want you to, I want you to get this. There is part of this that is true. This is how a lot of vaccines work. Some of you are against vaccines, but... I had the mumps when I was in first grade. I will never, ever, 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 ever get the mumps ever again. Why? Because God taught my body how to fight. Did. God taught my body how to fight. And I can be around people who have mumps all day long, twice on Sundays. And my body says to the mumps, bring it on. We're going to kick your tail all over this guy's body. And my body will not ever be subject to the disease of mumps ever again. 
my body, and I want you to get this. Let's transfer that now to your relationship with God. Let's, let's transfer this to the Bible. God teaches us how to fight battles. God te- he, te- he teaches us. He helps us. He will allow a nearly benign attack on us from various principalities or powers or rulers of darkness or spiritual wickedness in high places. He will allow those things to take place. They are all controlled by God. And he, he may let us be defeated the first time, because the first time I was introduced to mumps, I got the mumps. But after that, now that you know how to fight it off, you just square your shoulders and say, bring it on. I've dealt with you devils before. I can do it again. I may not like it, but I'll do it. You're not, you're not getting me ever again. I, I love this kind of stuff. I do. Now, here, here, I want you to listen to this. The treatment is in the trial phase as Innovio, one of the companies responsible for creating the technique, studies the artificial DNA's ability to prevent women with cervical lesions and getting cervical cancer. I want you to remember that word, cancer. Here is another article, and it's about the same company, Innovio. And if some of you are smart... I know what you're doing. You're going to the Inovio website. Get ready. Pioneering trials using man-made DNA begin in battle against cancer, Ebola, flu, and HIV. Now listen to this. Here's, I think it's a, a, a different article about the same thing. Pioneering new treatments for flu, Ebola, and can- cancer are being developed by scientists using man-made DNA. Experts have worked out how to create strands of artificial DNA, each mimicking a different killer disease, and inject them into patients. The idea is that the patient's immune system will then be able to recognize the threats and eliminate them. Pioneering new treatments for flu, Ebola, cancer are being developed by scientists. I already read that. Inovio, one of the companies behind the technique, has begun trials in humans at, and after strong results in the lab. Um, let's see here, blah, blah, blah. Dr. Joseph Kim, Inovio's chief executive, said, uh, uh, yeah, uh, we're, we're able to clear pre, pre-cancerous lesions, which, left untreated, can turn into full-blown cervical cancer, unquote. There is a word in your Bible about this. There's, there's all, it's, think, think Bible, people. It's always in the Bible. Second Timothy, check this out now. Second Timothy, two fourteen or fifteen. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Not, don't worry about what man thinks about you and about your ideas and about how you read your Bible. It's, it's really nobody else's business. They may not like it. They, they, they don't like me. They don't like some of the things I say because I teach what the Bible says, that there's one gospel, one salvation, one way to everlasting life, and that is by grace through faith, period, it's been that way since the beginning. It's going to be that way all the way till the end, and some people don't like that. And what they want me to do, and they want, what they want you to do, is they want you to study the Bible to show yourselves approved unto them. That's what they want. They're not going to be satisfied with anything that you say unless you bow before their doctrinal altar and, and repeat what they tell you to repeat, which 99% of the time does not contain any Bible verses or words. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you how that works here in a little bit. Uh, in verse 16, but shun profane and vain babblings. Quit getting into fights with everybody on Facebook. Okay? Uh, my choir director in high school, and I think he got it from Mark Twain, but my choir director in high school had a little cartoon taped to the... Um, uh, taped inside of his office, and it said, never try to teach a pig to sing. It wastes your time, and it annoys the pig. And I'm just telling you, shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Because you're trying to give Scripture, and you're trying to help people give, give understanding with Scripture, and there are people out there who don't want your help. And since they don't really have a lot of Bible verses to support their really ridiculous ideas, they start calling you names. 
and they start making fun of you. And then now all of a sudden you got you're getting because it hurts and it makes you mad. You get in the flesh and you launch back after them. Doesn't really do any good, does it? So anyway, but look at verse 17. And here's where I wanted to get. And their word will eat as doth a canker. In Joel chapter 1, he mentioned the canker worm. The word canker literally means consume. It 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 is something that consumes and devours and eats away. And look at there. Look at there. In verse 17, you have the definition for the word canker, which is where the word cancer comes from. And cancer is a devouring disease. Their word will eat as doth a canker. Cankers consume and eat until there's nothing left. My grandmother, on my dad's side, Meemaw, greatest cook in the history of the entire mankind, died. Her body was just eat up with cancer. It ate her to death is what it did. Their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred. Now I want you to understand this. Here's what your Bible is telling you. The truth has no errors in it, or it's not the truth, is it? The truth does not contain any errors. It cannot contain any errors. But when people use words to try to get you to think a certain way, their words have errors in them. And it always starts out with, in the King James, it says the word canker. But in the original Greek, let me tell you what it really says and what it really means. Their words, their words are diametrically opposed to what's been given to you here in the Word of God. It's like the anti-word or the lost word of Freemasonry. And those words will eat as doth a canker. They will vex you with their teachings. They will vex you with their doctrines. They will vex you with their philosophies and their, and their $20 words. They will, they will say things that will stun and amaze you. And they were very eloquent in their speeches. But the truth is they lack Scripture. And they're not giving you Bible. They're giving you their words, and those words are going to eat as doth a canker until there's nothing left of you. And it all starts with erring from the truth, and Jesus said, thy word is truth. And according, just put these two verses together, made them together. And the idea is that there cannot be any errors in the word, or it's not true. It's not truth. See, it ceases to be the truth. When, it, uh, when you add the words of, of man in it. But that's, that's what that's talking about. And they're, they're going to introduce to you bad words in hopes that your body will be able to learn how to fight the bad word. By the way, that's what a virus is. A virus is a, a little strand of DNA or maybe RNA. I'm not sure. But that's what it is. And it goes through your body, and it attaches itself. I don't know exactly. That's probably going to be something else I'm going to study. But it attaches itself to certain parts of your body, and it's not. your body says, this ain't right. This is not right at all. And there's been some viruses going around Bethel, and every, just about every place I've been this winter, there's been a real bad, nasty cold that has gone on for weeks. Pastor Burks down in Harrison, Arkansas, was trying to host uh, all of the preachers there at the, um, uh, at the preaching conference, the camp meeting we had, and the, the poor man was just sick as a dog. And he called me a couple of days. He called me Monday or Tuesday, I think, and I said, Brother Lonnie, go to bed. It's over with. Go to bed. Get some rest. Uh, but anyway, that's what this is about. Now, I want, I want you to listen to this one. Here's another article, and I want you to get this because this is going to segue right into what we're talking about. Why is the scientific world a buzz? Well, they're probably high on what was it Francis Crick was taking, or Watson. They were taking um, LSD so they could clear their mind of scientific thoughts so they could visualize what DNA looked like. Why is the scientific world a buzz about an unpublished paper? Because it could permanently change human DNA. Did you hear that? Permanently change human DNA. Um, scientists around the world are buzzing. About a highly anticipated study that is yet to be published but could mark a major milestone in genetic and embryonic research. Scientists around the world are anticipating the results of a Chinese study 
that would mark the first time DNA, listen to this, DNA in a human embryo. They wait till the egg has become fertilized and it grows into an embryo. And they now, the Chinese scientists now have a way of going into that embryo, testing the DNA, finding out what's bad, clearing out what's bad, and replacing it with their alterations of it, their DNA editing. If you remember, I've talked about this um, over time. There's a technique called the CRISPR device. And the CRISPR device, that's an anagram for something. I don't remember what it is. But it's basic, it's, this, its whole purpose and function is to change and rewrite DNA. That's what it's there for. Uh, all the, the embryos would be for study only. <laughs> Who believes that? We're just studying this. We're not actually going to do this and, like, make people. And We're just studying it. <laughs> uh, not intended for Im implantation. The research would mark a significant milestone. The first time human DNA had been altered so substantially that it would change the germ line. Here's what it says. The eggs or sperm of any child produced from the embryo change them permanently. A permanent change. Theoretically, that could allow parents in the not so not too distant future to essentially clean their own eggs and sperm of undesired genes. Un desired. Let me tell you what that looks like in the Bible. Yea, hath God said, that is questioning the genetics. Yea, hath God said, you should not eat of every tree of the garden. That, that's, that's questioning it. Number two, giving, showing that it has what God said has undesired traits. God said, for in the day thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. The serpent said, thou shalt not surely die. That, the, the phrase, thou shalt die, surely die, is undesirable. We don't want that. We want to be able to do what we want to and sin without any recourse whatsoever and then live forever that way. That's what we want as a species. Thou shalt surely die is, un, is an undesirable trait. So we're going to change it. Thou shalt not surely die. And then you have a replacement. You have, it, you have what God said edited. For, for God doth know. I have a new thing now that's going to eat you as a canker. For God doth know in the day that ye eat thereof, then you shall be as what? God or gods? Which is it? I know the answer. Okay? Uh... I'll probably be able to show this to you Tuesday. I'm just trying to gauge about how far I get, all right? Uh, but anyway, they're going to take out undesired genes, such as ones known to cause cancer, and prevent those genes from being passed on to grandchildren and great-grandchildren. See, it, it's permanent. And then the child that's born this way is going to pass down that genetic line to his seed, to his generation. Um. The article says, in terms of changing the germline, we are very close. Um, who is this fella here? George Church. In animal models, you can make animal sperm that has whatever alteration that you want. You, to say that we're far away, I think, would be naive. To embrace it right away without proper testing would also be naive. They can't wait to start altering the genetics of human beings. They can't wait. We, we've got to get on this. Ray Kurzweil is pushing us. He doesn't want to die. And so we're going to try to figure out a way so that Ray can live forever. Ray, who is a lost man, doesn't believe in God, doesn't believe that. Well, he does believe in God. He believes in a God that man is going to create. And that God, people, listen, listen to all these things being told to us now about DNA and technology and wearable electronics, soon to be implantable electronics, melding humanity in with the virtual world, the computer world, altering our DNA 
fusing it in with other DNA from other things that are in the earth or man just writing it out himself and saying, here, this is what you can be. Listen to where we are. It's coming. It's right around the corner. I don't know when. I don't predict when. I don't say. I think like maybe like by next next Friday afternoon at 1237, I think we all be out of here. I can't say that. What I'm telling you is the snowball is getting bigger and it's rolling faster down the hill. And I think we ought to wise up. I think we ought to pay attention to what's going on. And I think that we need to be, have our minds and our eyes and our ears giving attendance to the Word of God in these days. Because that's our only salvation. That's what's going to prevent us from falling for and believing the lie that is about to be told. And there's going to be, I mean, it's going to be a whopper of a lie. I don't know what it is. If I knew what it was, I would tell everybody what it is. If I even had a little theory, I might suggest it. But I don't know what that is. But I think God's people, because I believe the Bible, and I believe the Bible says there should be a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, I believe that those of us who really believe the Bible will go, there it is right there. That's the lie. We're not falling for it. We're not going to fall for it, literally. We're going, to, we're going to believe the Word of God. I got my shield of faith. My faith is in what God said, not what man said, not what the preachers are saying, not what the Bible college are saying. By the way, um, Jason wrote me an email, and he was asking about Bible colleges. I've made a few statements about Bible colleges. I do not believe that all Bible colleges are evil. I believe that a large, large portion of them will change your mind about the Bible. That's what happened to me. And that was 1984. I was my freshman year in Bible college, 1984. And it changed me. And I, I was told by a young man who sent me an email, and, and he said, there's still some good colleges out there to teach the King James Bible. But Jason said, do you know if, if Bible colleges and seminaries have this kind of hold over what should be independent churches? In other words, if, if men go to Bible college, do they have to swear an oath or sign an oath saying that what they preach is going to reflect the doctrinal statement of a particular college? Now, I am not aware of that. I went to two Bible colleges. I did sign an oath going into both of those. They were Christian colleges. I signed an oath saying that I would abide by the rules and terms um, of, the, of the particular college, both of them that I went to, fairly conservative. This is back in the mid-'80s. Um, ha we had a curfew we had to abide by. We could not be uh, found guilty of any sort of immorality or anything like that. And I, I was friends with a guy that got booted out because he got his girlfriend pregnant while we were all in Bible college. And, uh, but, but anyway, um, I am not aware of any colleges that would hold that kind of authority over people saying that once you leave out of here, you better preach what we taught you or, or whatever. Let me tell you how, how I changed. I changed, number one, because of the repeated statements being taught to me by the professors textual variance. Um, this text doesn't line up with this text, and it's an enigma. It's a mystery. How do we know what God really said? We should investigate further because we don't know what God really said. We don't know what Greek manuscript we should use. And then it was, I wanted to get along with the student body. I wanted to get along. I wanted them to be my friends. And by the time I was in my uh, second, into my third year in Bible college, I was the student body chaplain. I was the guy everybody was coming to for advice and for help and for prayer and everything like that. And, buddy, I was Mr. Popularity in this. It was a small college. It's four students there. No, just kidding, just kidding. But anyway, they were coming to me. And the reason why is I decided to adopt and adapt my thinking to their thinking. So I no longer would tell everybody, what, you're not using the King James? What is wrong with you? I didn't, I didn't do, do that. I became Mr. Nice Guy. So the college itself did not try to enforce some rule on me after I left that changed me. It was the vexation 
of the people that I was around and what I was hearing every day. That's where it comes from. That's where the change comes from. All right? Changing DNA. Um, let's see here. Where do I want to start? Let me do, let's see if this, here we go. Let's go to this verse of scripture here. We're, we're going to look at the vines of the word of God. And I'll show you what I mean by that here in just a minute. We have the pure vine. My, my nose is itching like crazy today. There we go. We have the, let me get my uh, ugly face out of the way here. Here we go. We have the pure vine of Christ, which is the word of God. And we have the corrupt vine, the vine of Sodom. How can you tell which Bible you have? How can you tell? By the fruit. And the fruit that comes off that vine is either going to be the incorruptible fruit from an incorruptible seed it's going to have the purity of Jesus Christ and the holiness of the Holy Ghost in it and the authority of God the Father, or it's going to be corrupt, and the fruit that comes out of it is going to be fruit. It's going to be sodomy. Does that answer the question for you, why so many churches have gotten into sodomy? Why so many churches have embraced the lettuce, gravy, bacon, tomato, LGBT crowd? Why they're wanting them in? It's because there is a corrupt vine of Sodom in their midst. And so you have to ask the question, do I believe that I am born again of corruptible seed or incorruptible seed? And he connects it here saying it's the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. And he says uh, of the corruptible seed and the vine of Sodom, their rock is not as our rock. We know who that is, don't we? We know who that is. Go to 1 Corinthians 10, and you'll see the rock, which is Jesus Christ. These are mated together here. Their rock is not as our rock, even, our, even uh, our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom and the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall, their, and it's unmitigated gall, too. Their clut, that was a joke. And their, their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons. The cruel venom of asps. Is this not laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? You know what God's treasure is? It's his word. That's his treasures. When I, when I say, God, I want you to make me rich, I mean, God, fill me up with Bible verses and I'll be rich, I'll be wealthy, I'll be prosperous. What you, what you do in me, God, will prosper. That's the kind of prospering I believe in. You give me money, I'm just going to blow it, is what I'm going to do. You give me Bible verses and give me understanding from the Word of God, man, I'll, I'll be so rich, I can share it with everybody and not have to worry about running out. That's what I think that means. So we're introduced to this vine of Sodom. What is the fruit that it produces? Sodomy. Abominations. The man of sin. Think about it. The, the true vine is Christ. The vine of Sodom is what? It's their rock, little r. It's their rock. The Antichrist. The stone cut with hands. The image of the beast made by the hands of men. That's what that is. And that vine is poison. See, ask, ask the question. Does my Bible come from the true vine, or does it come from the corrupt vine? And if it comes from the corrupt vine, it's very simple. It's poison. Even though it looks like a Bible, it's not. It's poison. What did they, what did they, what did these kings have in the old days? They had a food taster. Why? Because these kings were always like, uh, I think someone's trying to kill me. Yeah, I think my own people are trying to kill me. And they want my throne, and I'm not going to let them have it. And so, hey, you, take a bite out of all this food for me. You mean me, your majesty? Yeah, you. Go ahead, just take a bite. Take a drink of that wine there. See what happens. And if that guy lived, then that food was okay for the king to eat. But here's the thing. 
He couldn't just look at the plate to see if the food was poisoned. Couldn't just look at it. He could only determine by the results. And you ask yourself the honest, legitimate question, what is the result of these defiled Bibles being used in the churches almost exclusively without the King James Version? What is the, what is the result of this? What is the fruit of it? Sodomy, adultery, fornication, the, all kinds of sins that, are, that you would think of in San Francisco are in churches now. Many of them being done by the pastors and the pastor's wives and the, and the leadership. Of the, think of, um, what was his name, Ted Haggard up in Colorado. Got a big mega church up there and everybody loves him and all he's hearing from God and this and that and the other. Come to find out, the man was hiring sodomite prostitutes who would bring him methamphetamine. He was a dope head and, and queer is what he was. What, what fruit did that vine produce? It produced him. And so the story from the Bible is one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered thereof wild gourds his lap full and came and shred them into the pot of pottage, for they knew them not. By the way, the, the, last weekend while I was in that uh, camp meeting preaching conference, Brother uh, Clark Snow, pastor out in Fayetteville, Arkansas, whoo, pig suey, um, they are nuts about Razorback football out there. Anyway, he preached an outstanding message. I have it posted on my, on my um, it's on my Facebook page. It's on my YouTube channel, too. Just type in Pastor Clark Snow, and you'll see it. And his sermon was called Death in the Pot. It's, I encourage you to listen to it. Uh, but anyway, they shred them into the pot, for they knew them not. That is bringing these new Bibles now into the church, and the old people are going, well, that don't sound like the Bible to me. What, honey, what verse he say is on? I'm looking right at the verse, and I don't see it here. I don't know what. Maybe he just knows what he's doing. I don't know. I guess I'll just listen instead of reading my Bible. They know them not. So they poured out for the men to eat, and it came to pass as they were eating the pottage that they cried out and said, O thou man of God, there is death in the pot, and they could not eat thereof. Listen, your soul eats the word of God. Your soul takes in these things. And you're reading what's called a Bible on the outside, but you don't know that there's not any difference between the translations. So all of a sudden, you start reading. And if God gives you even an ounce of discernment, you're looking at a verse and you're going, what in the world? Or you happen upon one of them places in the translations where they took a whole verse out, like Acts chapter 8, verse 37, or 1 John 5, 7. And you're looking at a gap in the printing of your Bible. And all of a sudden, you're going, what is that? Why'd they take that out? And you go look it up in the King James, and you go, <gasps> they mess with my Bible. And all of a sudden, you close it up and say, you know what? I don't trust that. I don't trust that at all. I'm not going to read that anymore. I'm just going to read the old King James and ask God to give me discernment. And that's what you're supposed to be doing. Now, that company called Innovio, Here's their, they're the ones who are, who are making this quote-unquote man-made DNA. And they say that that's going to be better for everybody. Inno, which means, I guess, is innovation, and vio is life. An innovation of life. They're going to give people a new life, a, a born-again type experience. But it's corruptible seed. They're, in fact, they're admitting. They are admitting that they're introducing genetically altered diseases into people. Mm, 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 mm. Did you ever see, and I don't recommend you watching it, it's pretty good. Did you ever see World War Z, Brad Pitt? The zombie apocalypse has taken place, and of course, you know, the, the script of the movie is once you're bitten by a zombie, you've got like 20 seconds, 30 seconds, something like that, and you need to turn into a zombie. And he found out that the only way to avoid being eaten by the zombies was to inject a disease in his body, and they wouldn't want him. So they save mankind by afflicting him, okay? 
I think there's a precursor here. I think this is a foreshadow of, of something that's coming down the road. But anyway, look at their logo, Innovio. See the O there? What do you see here? You see two opposites. I'll tell you what it is. It's the Ouroboros. It is the serpent eating his tail. And it represents opposites. Uh, heaven and earth joining together it represents... Uh, sacred marriage. That's the word I'll use. Okay, here's the female, the mouth open. <laughs> that was pretty good, wasn't it? <laughs> here's the male, okay? <laughs> and that's the symbolism of it, okay? That's what that, that's what that symbol is. And the Ouroboros symbol itself is, is a symbol that represents uh, eternal life or everlasting life or being like being raised from the dead or um, it, it's it's the idea that now you're going to live forever and you're not ever going to die that's what the Ouroboros, Ouroboros symbol represents and it's right in front of our eyes they're editing DNA and the truth of it is the scientists I think learned that they could and should edit DNA because the Parsons and the preachers and the religious organizations were editing the Bible long before they figured out how to edit DNA. What you see in the church is being presented as reality now in this world. And this is what everybody's turning to. This is what everybody's doing. Now, let me get back to where we were the other day, which was, what, yesterday? It's been a long day. Anyway... Here's your DNA. It has two strands, old, new, shows the passage from death to, the, to life. Um, it is our connection with heaven. Um, it is joined together by four base pairs, cytosine, guanine, adenine, and thymine. And we noted that thymine was different. And we could see the difference. By the way, I'm going to correct something. I'm rethinking this. I mentioned to you yesterday that I thought, and I said this this weekend too, that I thought, I know that John is thymine. John's different than the synoptic gospels, and that's what thymine is. Thymine is different because it's not present in RNA, a single strand, okay, like the Old Testament. John is, or excuse me, thymine is not present there. Uracil is. But when it becomes complete, uracil is done away with, the old is done away with. Did you catch that? The old is done away with, and a new brought in, thymine. Isn't it cool? Okay? You're going to get tired of me saying that, but everything that this is is, like, cool. All right? So thymine's different. And I thought that Matthew and John were the two that were joined together, like thymine with adenine. Okay. However, and I said that because Matthew and John were of the original 12 and Mark and Luke were not. However, there is another interesting thing that popped into my mind last night. Out of these four books that talk about death, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, death and everlasting life. He's alive forevermore. Every, all four books talk about that. They connect death to life again. Out of the four books that do that, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, only two of these books talk about the birth of Jesus Christ, Matthew and Luke. Mark and John say nothing other than John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, which shows you that, number one, Jesus was there in the beginning. Jesus already was the Word of God. Jesus already was God, even from the beginning. He already was. Before, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And you remember when he said that, and the priests were going, I can't listen to this! All right, that's, that's what happened. Anyway, I kind of think maybe that Matthew and Mark represent guanine and cytosine because of their description of the birth of Jesus Christ, while Mark and John 
might be paired together because they are silent about it. Something to think about, something interesting to just kind of ponder over, all right? So now, anyway, watch this. We have, uh, this is, and I haven't changed all the script yet. Matthew and John, Luke and Mark. John is different. Bella, Rachel, Zilpa, Leah, they, they are the, were the tw- 12, the 12 patriarchs, the 12 tribes were what? Born of four. You, you remember the guy that couldn't walk? Remember that guy? And he was on it like a sheet. And they wanted to get him in to see Jesus, and the crowd was there. And how many guys were carrying him? Four. Four guys were carrying him in. Listen, these four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they'll take you to Jesus, people. They will. They'll carry you right up to Jesus' lap. They'll lower you right down in front of him, and Jesus will say, rise up and walk. And they, uh, By the way, your sins be forgiven too. Amen? I love this. Okay? Born of four. Anyway, the 12 tribes were born of four. Leah, Zilpah, which was her handmaid, Rachel, and Billah, which was Rachel's handmaid. The one that's different is Rachel. Let's see. Rachel. Rachel is different because she was the true love of Jacob. And so was John. John was the disciple whom Jesus loved. They both had that significance to them. Boy, man, his Bible's right. All right, now, and then I mentioned yesterday, Azariah, Hananiah, Mishael, and Daniel. And it was interesting to me that out of these four, Daniel, I think, represents Urusel because when it's time for Azariah, Hananiah, Mishael to be saved... Daniel, who was an Old Testament prophet, can't save them. Emmanuel can, the Son of God. So Neb looks in the fiery furnace, and he sees, I, he says, I threw three men in there, but I see four men walking. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. No, it doesn't say that! The fourth looks like the Son of God. See, he's different, isn't he? By the way, in in Daniel chapter 7, you have four great beasts rising up out of the sea. You have a lion with eagle's wings, a leopard with four wings, a bear, and the fourth beast is different than the other. I mean, actually, let me open open up the Bible to Daniel chapter 7. You'll see the language there in Daniel, and you'll understand that the fourth is always different. Okay? Just go go looking in your Bible for things that are grouped together in fours. Number four is going to be different than the other three. You look at um, verse 7 of Daniel 7. 7, 7. That's interesting. After this, I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth that devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue of it with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten. It says it right there that he was different. He was diverse than the other ones. Here's how I think they're paired. Notice that two of these beasts have wings, and two of them do not. Okay? So I just, I just think there's a pairing there. that, that It matches... The, the, uh, the parameters that matches the guideline that, that we find in DNA. This is what we're being told about it. And people didn't know this 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. They didn't know any of this. And this is why I say I think that the times that we live in right now call for a, not a new Bible, not for a rewrite of the Bible, but for fresh eyes to be looking at the old book and we will see, th- and we are seeing things right now that our forefathers never saw. Nothing against them whatsoever. They were looking. God had promised His word to all generations, did He not? Of course He did. But God is showing this generation things that those previous generations could not have even conceived. They had no idea. But now we see it. Look at Genesis chapter 2 for an example. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. You should be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now, 
I know you've probably heard me talk about this before, but I've got something to show you on this thing. I mentioned, I hinted at it yesterday. The significance of Adam and the fact that when Adam sinned, I sinned. I was in Adam. I was. I was there. You were too. Moses was there. Jesus, as far as his human part, was there as well. Okay? Now, watch this. And some of you already know where I'm going with this, but I've underlined the words that Adam said. And let's talk about the birds and bees for a minute, okay? Here's the man, and here's the woman. And the man has 23 chromosomes, which are bundles that I got to show you this. I thought, I thought, let me, let me go back to me for a minute, okay? I thought that, let me put it right there. There we go. I thought that, I, you know, I noticed that the DNA, when it's, when it's rolled up together like a scroll, it takes on the form of a cross, and that's what the chromosomes are. And there's 46 of them in, your, in every cell of your body. And those, those, that DNA book is rolled up and takes on the form of a cross. I thought that it just did that, okay? But I was wrong. I learned that there's actually something that it wraps around to form that cross. It's called a histone, H-I-S-T-O-N-E. And the word histone is a German word that is derived from a Greek word, and it means something that stands. Now, I want you to get this. This is right in your Bible. This is, this is in the book of Numbers, the fourth book of the Old Testament. This is in the book of John, the fourth book of the New Testament. You see that DNA winding around that histone, which is like a pole or rod, looks like a serpent coiled around a rod. And the histone is electrically charged, and it, and it attracts the DNA to it, and the DNA just by nature wraps around that histone, that rod. That's what that, and the rod makes it look like this. The rod does. And you know, if you don't, numbers, the people were dying, they were bit, being bitten by fiery flying serpents, which I believe in, and they were dying. And God said, Moses, put a serpent on a pole and set it before all Israel. And when they look upon it, they'll live. Look and live, my brother, live, look to Jesus. And Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted. Isn't that, oh, that's so good. Even in your DNA, wrapping around the histones, which basically means this thing stands up, you have the story of, of the serpent and the pole and Jesus on the cross, and it looks like Jesus on the cross. That's what your X chromosomes look like. Hallelujah! I love this. Now watch this. Adam's got 23. Eve's got 23. They decided to get together and do a little adding. So they added 23 to 23. And they formed a new baby, which has 23 of him and 23 of her. And now this baby has 46. And this is the exact number of words in your King James Bible that Adam said. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man, and think of Jesus, by the way. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. Who is Jesus' father? It's God the Father. Who is the mother? Jerusalem, which is above, which is free shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be, look here, that's what a baby is. It's one flesh. It is, here you have in 46 words the absolute miracle of the joining together of two sets 
of 23 chromosomes apiece. And that baby has 46. And I just, I love this stuff, okay? Now watch this. In thy book, all my members were written. So think of it like this. Your fingers are members. Your elbow is a member. Your smelly armpits is a member. Your eyes are, your toes are, your lips are. Everything about your body is a member of your body, and every member of your body is written down in the book of DNA before it was ever formed in fashion. Before you had lips, there was a strand of DNA that said, we're going to give them some lips, and buddy, they're going to be some whopper lips, all right? And so some of you have big lips, and some of you have little beating lips, okay? And that was written down in your DNA book. That's how it works. And some of these parts are comely, and some of them are not. I mean, no one, no one looks in a fashion magazine and says, her armpits are out of this world. No one does that. But does the armpit serve a purpose? Does the armpit have a function to it? Of course it does. And I, I, I noticed this one day. I was outside. And man, it was July and it was hot. And I'm walking around, got my hands on my hips like this. And I just thought about that for a while. Why is it in summertime we're outside doing something and we, when we stand up, like, like we're doing yard work or something like that, and every now and then we got to stand up and try to let that breeze catch us if there is such a thing, and we put our hands on our hips. Why do we do that? We don't even think about it, and we do it. The reason why we do it is it's built into our body that here's the, here's the doorway to the heat. And in the wintertime, people will sit around like this all the time with their arms into their body. Why? They're holding heat in. In the summertime, they're outside. What are they doing? Walking around like this. You'll see baseball players, football players, people that play sports outside, especially when it's hot. You'll see them walking around like this. What are they doing? The heat. They're opening the heat doors. And your armpit isn't a very nice thing to look at, especially here in America. And here in America, we expect women's armpits to all be shaved. And then we every now and then you see... <laughs> You see some woman at Walmart, and you're going, good grief. Well, it serves a purpose. She's going to stay warmer than the rest of you guys in the wintertime, all right? But it, I'm just showing you that it, it serves a purpose. It serves a function. It, in, now, this is the human body book. In thy book, all my members were written. Now, watch this. In thy book, all my members were written. Here you have Elijah, Moses, you have Jean-Baptiste, John the Baptist. You have um, the Apostle Paul. You have John writing the, seeing the New Jerusalem, writing the book of Revelation. You have David playing his harp, writing the Psalms. Isn't it interesting that God didn't use one individual to write the entire scope of the Word of God? Like, oh, let's see, Mohammed. You don't have that in Christianity. God took many members. And each one of them, each member that you see, and let me ask you this, how many books of the Bible, and this is it's not a trick question, you'll say all of them, but how many books of the Bible did Jesus actually sit down with a pen and write? None. Jesus never wrote any of them. But he had all these members of his body, like Moses. And Moses' role and function was different than Elijah's. But both of them were doing exactly what God wanted them to do. They were serving the purpose according to the book. John the Baptist has a very limited ministry. His ministry was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 40. The voice of him crying in the wilderness, make you straight. Uh, the, the paths of the Lord make a... I can't remember what it says anyway, but his role was to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And once his role was fulfilled, he got locked up and his head cut off. He was over with. Paul gets to write a majority of the New Testament, but not all of it. 
John gets to see the end. He gets to see New Jerusalem before anybody else does, and he gets to write about it. And David, writing, my goodness, a majority of the Psalms, God uses each one of these men, and they all have different ways and different, different, they even write differently. And the Holy Ghost used that diversification in your Bible because that is exactly how it is in our bodies. It's the same DNA the Bible is. It's the same book, the same DNA, but it has all these members in particular that make up the whole body. Mm, 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 mm. Now watch this, 1 Corinthians 12. And by the way, that applies to us. And look at, look at these verses here. Let me um, go back here. Here we go. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, think about what the spirit is. It's the word. It's DNA. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews. You see, listen to me. I'm, I'm just going to plead with my brethren. My brethren who believe that Jews are saved a different way. Let me plead with you. Let me reason with you. The truth of it is, if God saves my right hand, the left hand's going with it. If God saves, by grace, through faith, any part of my body, the rest of the body goes with it. And he says right here, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. And, and I like this. One of these days, Jesus is going to be crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And when he's crowned, when, he, when the head is crowned, the rest of the body is wearing the same crown. Isn't it neat? For the body is not one member, but many. The Bible wasn't written by one person. It was written by many, 40. And if the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? And some of you, some of us were designed to hear, some of us were designed to speak, some of us were designed to smell, and some of you do it better than others. And he says, But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. Who? God. So you know what I've learned? Listen, people, when you grow up, I'm saying this to people who I've seen your Facebook posts. I know how mean you are to other Christians. I see how demeaning you are to people that don't think like you and don't see it the way you do and don't always agree with all your stuff. I've had to learn as I mature as a man, as a pastor, as a believer, as a teacher, I've had to learn that not everybody can have what I have. Not everybody serves the purpose that I serve. It's not for, and, and I'll say this, you're looking for a church. Don't expect the pastor of that church to be like Mike Hoggard. Don't. God gave him a different role, a different function, and I, I even believe, listen to this now, this is, I, don't, I don't have a problem calling brethren in the Lord who believe some things that I just preach against. I don't have a problem calling them brethren. You know why? Same book. Same book. Same father. E even in the story of the prodigal son, there, the, the man had two sons, and they were different from one another. 
and the youngest son just had to go and find out what the world was like and eat pig slop before it really settled in him. I should have stayed with dad. And the oldest son looked down with disdain at the youngest son, but the truth of it is, to the father, they were both his sons. They were both had his DNA. And so, people, I, I'm just going to encourage you and maybe correct you. Quit thinking that everybody has to agree with you all the time. Quit thinking that because somebody has a different idea about something in the Bible that they must be wrong because you know for a fact that you're right. And I'll, tell you, I'll say it again. Who said that you had to be right on everything? God never said it. In fact, God said you're a liar. There is something that I teach that is in error. If I knew what it was, I would correct it. And at times I have. But God's not going to let me say everything true. He won't let me because God is the only one who's going to be true 100% of the time. And so God give me, I don't know, maybe I'm the armpit. I don't know. God gave this man something else. God gave this guy over here something else. And I'll say this. This pinky shouldn't look at this thumb and say, well, how come I wasn't made like you? I want to be like Mr. Thumbkin over here. Don't do that. If God made you a pinky, be a pinky. Okay? If God made you an armpit, be an armpit. For the glory of Jesus Christ, be an armpit. That's, that's what God made you. But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. Why one body? It's one DNA, one book. And I'll, I'll also say this, too. I think there are guys out there and people out there who believe God, trust Jesus with all their heart, and they're using some of the version of the Bible. And I'm telling you, I think God's going to bring them around one of these days. He did me. You could, have, you could have looked at me 20 years ago and said, Hoggard's an apostate. He's using the NIV. He's, using, he's giving all these, doing all this Greek stuff. He don't believe the King James Bible. You could have looked at me and said that. God had plans. You didn't see them. I didn't see them. So let's not be so quick to write everybody off, all right? Let's not be so quick to do that. Maybe they're at that time where God is leading them through the wilderness so he can get them to the promised land. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. Nay, much more these those members of the... Uh, by the way, can I, I want to show you why the these and the thous are in the King James Bible. It's right here in this verse, okay? the Look at verse 21. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. You know what that is? That is hand, he's talking about one hand, the is second person singular, not you, the is. So he says unto one hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. You see, see the difference? Right there in that verse, I have no need of you. Why? Because you is second person plural, always. By the way, I saw something the other day for the first time, and I've been preaching and talking about this verse most of my life. When the serpent addressed Eve in the Garden of Eden, he never said thee or thou. He said ye, which is second person plural. I don't know what that means yet, but it just jumped out to me. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, I say never use second person singular. I don't know. I have to go back and look at it. But several times in that passage, you go check it out. He said ye, second person plural. It means something. I don't know what it means yet, but it's there for a reason. Anyway, that just jumped out at me. Verse 22. 
Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. Who wants to go out on a date with John the Baptist? Nobody. He's wearing an ugly coat. He won't cut his hair. And he's got locust legs stuck to his lips. Not that big a prize, I'm telling you, but God used him. There could only be one John Baptist. There could only be one and God used him. He was an uncomely part who had a far more important role to serve than any of those Pharisees and any of those scribes out there. And then he says, For our comely parts have no need, but God has tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to the part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And look at this. And, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you're the body of Christ and members in particular. And I like this thing about the, whether one member suffer and all the members suffer with it. Have you ever, you ever had a cold? You ever had the flu? Flu is a total somatic illness. It covers the entire body. Now, it affects the upper respiratory system. You're coughing, sniffling. You can't hardly breathe. You're snot running out of your nose all the time. You're coughing up big chunks of goo. But you feel bad all over. I've had, I've had a couple surgeries. Um, had my right shoulder repaired. That's where the electrical current went out in 2006. I had major surgery done to my right shoulder. I was absolutely amazed at the fact that for two weeks, I didn't even want to get up out of bed. Why? My whole body was yielding its strength and doing without so that my shoulder could be healed and repaired. I had I had a, a umbilical hernia right next to my belly button back in, um, what was that, maybe 2004, somewhere around in there, and had that repaired, and I thought that I could preach the next Sunday. Boy, was I wrong. I was so weak and tired, I couldn't even read the Bible verses. I had to have Jared come up and read the Bible verses for me. That's how weak I was because my entire body was yielding its strength and doing without things that it needed so that the wound could be repaired. That's how God designed it, people. And we are all too quick to walk away from those that have been wounded, even when that wound is self-afflicted. Watch this, watch this, okay? And this, if you want to get to know Mike Hoggard, Mike Hoggard is not a surgeon or a mechanic because you put a tool in my hand and I'm going to drop it. That's just me. I drop stuff or I work on something and I've got this really sharp thing in my hand, and I'm trying to jab and poke at something, and I guarantee you, I'm going to slice my finger or my hand. Stupid. Nobody cut me. I did it to myself. I'm an idiot. You know what happens? You know what happens? I want to show you this. My right hand's got a sharp tool in it, and I'm holding something with my left hand. My left hand is not as strong as my right hand. That's why I'm doing this, this way. My left hand is helping me. All of a sudden, I make a mistake, and I stab my left hand. You know what that is? That's me saying something stupid while I'm preaching and offending somebody and hurting them. In your body, the moment I cut my hand, 
I drop the tool because I'm going to do that anyway. And I cover that. The very hand that caused the offense is the hand that comes to the rescue to soothe the wound and to stop the bleeding. You just, you just ponder how deep that is, people. It would be stupid for me to go, oh, yeah? Oh, bleed to death. You shouldn't have been there. It's your fault anyway. I didn't do anything wrong. That's how we are. God help us and forgive us for the people that we have wounded and didn't at least try to go and comfort them and apologize and try to make it right. Because not even our body acts that way, and we know it. And yes, there are things I absolutely cannot do with my left hand. But my right hand has never held it against my left hand that it couldn't do certain things. And I'm going to say this to some preachers and some just whoever, whoever can receive it. I'm telling you, there are people in the body of Christ who can't do what you can do. There are people in the body of Christ who are very weak and they're very fragile. You can take this skin on your elbow and pinch it all day long, and you, you can tell how thick it is. You can pinch that skin all day long, and, and you can pinch it as hard as you can. And want her, get a pair of pliers and go <laughs> squeeze that down there. Won't even hardly hurt. And some of you, I, listen, I know some of you preachers. I know how you are. Some of you preachers think, oh, that's your own fault. You're not that way. Why can't you be that way? And there's a piece of skin right here that if you just take, I mean, just a little millimeter of it and grab it and pinch it, it's like fire shooting up and down your arm. And rubbing it just makes it worse. And it stays there for a long time, doesn't it? And you know what I'm telling you? Not everybody's as good as you are. Not everybody is as strong and stable as you are. Not everybody who's a Christian and a believer in Jesus Christ can stay away from the stuff that you stay away from. Not everybody can do that. God made the body that way for a reason. And every body in the body is blessed by the same DNA as the others. And we shouldn't be all schisming against one another if we all believe the King James Bible. We shouldn't be all dividing up, saying, well, these, these people are not saved. They're not even saved. They don't believe what I say. We shouldn't be doing that. Our body doesn't do that. Boy, this Bible's right, isn't it? Anyway, wherefore, I like this. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. What time is it? My goodness, I need to get moving. I got I to gotta show you this. I got to show you what I found last week. I mean, I prayed, God, I don't know what to do down Harrison. I have no idea. And boom, 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 there it was. A body hast thou prepared me. The body that was born of the Virgin Mary in Luke chapter 2, Matthew, that was the body that God gave him at his first coming. And it was written in the volume of the book. Everything that Jesus was back then, he was made, think of it this way, Jesus' first coming was the Old Testament book. His second coming is the New Testament book. And he comes both times in the volume of the book it is written of him, to do thy will, O God. Jesus was just doing what the DNA told him to do. The body of his first coming was born of the Virgin Mary. The body of his second coming is born of Jerusalem, which is above, which is free, which is the mother of us all. We are that body. We're, and though all of us are different members, we are all the self-same body. And when he appears in the clouds, we will appear with him and be his body. We will be with him so that wherever he goes, we go. So if he comes down from heaven riding on a white horse, we're coming down with him as his body riding on a white horse. I got to show you this. The Bible calls itself the book of life. The book of life, that's DNA. That's what DNA is. The words that I speak unto you, they are life. Thou hast the words of eternal life. The words of this life, Acts 
5.20, the word of life, Philippians 2.16, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, of the word of life. DNA is the word of life. Your Bible is the word of life. And if there's a problem in your DNA, it'll kill you. If your DNA, going from one cell to the next, doesn't do it perfectly, and I mean perfectly, If it's not copied perfectly from one cell to the next, that cell's dead. It's going to die. Or it may live just long enough to reproduce. And then you've got canker eating you. Now, Holy Bible equals DNA, right? We got it? All God's people said. Now, uh, look at it this way. I'm going to try to explain this to you. The various ways that you see these amino acids, these base pairs, excuse me, cytosine, thymine, guanine, adenine, cytosine, adenine, you see the way that these are laid out. There's four of them. And the combination of these produce what's called an amino acid. Think of it like this. When we draw lines on paper, if we have just, oh, you can't see it, can you? Good grief. There we go. Now that's better, isn't it, children? Let me back up. The combination of these base pairs forms what's called an amino acid, and there's four base pairs. Think of it this way. When you draw lines on a piece of paper, just draw random lines. You have no idea what they mean. But when you draw lines and little circles and things like that, you're moving the pen or the pencil or the brush in one of or a combination of four directions, up and down, right and left. It's four directions, right? So you take these lines or these circles, you put them together into something that's readable. And the letter T here is just made up of a line that goes this, these two directions and a line that goes these two directions. These, does that make sense to everybody? It's four directions, and whether it's a circle or a half circle or a line of some kind, or even a diagonal line like in the letter Z, it's still one of four directions or a combination of the four directions. Well, the same thing is here. You have a combination of these four bases that join together in a certain... Not all the letters, by the way, look the same, do they? The whole alphabet in English is not just the letter T. T. T, 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 Have no idea what that is. Has to be different letters. So there has to be different combinations. So let's say that this, this, let, this uh, amino or this base pair set forms a amino acid called lysine. Let's just say that that's, I don't know if that's how it is, but let's say this combination makes this letter lysine. It's an amino acid. And there's, let's say that you have lysine and then you have another sequence of lines and it makes tryptophan and this one makes alanine. And so just the lysine itself doesn't do anything in the body. It doesn't make the hair grow longer or whatever. It doesn't do that. But lysine plus tryptophan plus alanine in this order. Let's say it makes you tall. You get it? Now it's a word. But just by itself, it's just a letter, and it won't really do anything. But you put the letters together just like in a word, then it does something. It does something makes you, makes you taller or makes your hair grow or makes your hair fall out or whatever it is. That's how DNA works. And there's 22 of these amino acids. There's 22 letters in the Hebrew Aleph bet, and they all follow this same rule. Diagonal lines, up and down lines, crossways lines. Four directions to make a Hebrew letter. And you have 22 of them. That's how many amino acids. And when you take the, the letters, and like, uh, let's see here. Let's, we, we're going to take a, um, a yod. Where's a yod? We're going to take a yod, and we're going to take a hay. And we're going to take a, a vav, let's see here, where is it? Where is vav? Vav, right here. And another hey, and you have yod hey vah hey. You have Jehovah. Okay? That's what you have. 
Same thing is done in DNA. The combination of any of these 22 amino acids makes a word and a series of words, like a sentence, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord, and now we know what that is. That performs a function in uh, the book. Now, watch this. I drink Diet Mountain Dew. Got it right here. I eat fried chicken. I like to eat no sugar added blue bunny butter pecan ice cream with peanut butter at night. And I love beans and cornbread. And I eat big, fat, greasy cheeseburgers. It's just what I do. My body and your body needs insulin. How does my body and your body... What, what one of these, these food groups... Which one of these foods has insulin in it? Is it the beans? No. <laughs> the beans have other things in it. Is it the soda pop? Oh, if it was a soda pop, I'd be home free, man. Is it the fried chicken? Is it the hamburger? Is it the ice cream? Which one of these food groups, these f five basic food groups for me, which one of these has insulin in it? The answer is none of them. There's not a single thing in the world that we eat that supplies our body with insulin, and yet every body living needs insulin because insulin is what opens the doorway to the cells so that sugar can be deposited into the cells so that the cells can burn the sugar, just like priests burning sacrifices in the tabernacle, so that it creates energy in the cell so that we can do things. When my blood sugar gets high, it's because my insulin is not opening the cells. And the blood sugar, the sugar in my blood is building up, but my cells are weakened because they have no energy. They have no food. And when, when my blood sugar gets 130, 140, 150, I mean, I have such a low tolerance for high blood sugar. My blood sugar never gets into two, three, four hundred, because by the time I reach 140, 150, all I want to do is lay down and go to sleep, and sometimes that's exactly what I do. So I need insulin. Where am I going to get it from? It's not in any of these food groups. Where does it come from? Does it just magically appear in my bloodstream because God wants it there? Even God, in the things that he does, has a way that he does it. Where do we get insulin from? It's in our DNA. There is a recipe for insulin in our code book, in our Bible. There's a recipe for insulin. Let me explain it this way to you. I love this. When I first learned about the role of insulin. My dad was diabetic, and I never really understood what it was. I knew that he needed insulin. He took two to three shots a day, every day. But when I, when the doctor said, "There, your problem is your blood sugar is too high. You have diabetes," and he told me a little bit of you know, and I had to take medicine, and I I changed my diet and everything like that. But then I decided to read what caught, why it's there, what happens, what does insulin do? And insulin basically has one function. That is, it opens the doorway to the cell so the sugar can go in and be burnt by the cell and you can have energy. And if it doesn't open that door, then it just builds up in the bloodstream and that's diabetes. So I got to thinking about that. I'm going, that's in the Bible. That's in the Bible. Because my cell is the tabernacle. Every cell in my body is a tabernacle, and in that tabernacle, there's an altar there that burns food. Get it? And by the way, everything burnt on the altar had DNA in it. Nobody brought rocks and pebbles and dust as a sacrifice for God. Nobody did. Or water. Nobody did. They brought either grain or animals. All of them have DNA. Man, it's good. It's good, good, good. And we don't eat anything that doesn't have DNA. Our hamburgers 
all have DNA. The cow has DNA. The onions have DNA. The wheat had DNA. The sesame seeds, they basically sesame seeds. You're eating little bundles of DNA. That's what you're doing. Everything we eat has DNA. We don't eat rocks and, well, sometimes. So it's the same thing. It matches. And here's the thing. The Levite priests and only the Levite priests stood at the doorway to the tabernacle when a person brought in a lamb or some grain or whatever it was for sacrifice, and it was the Levite priest only who took that sacrifice and went through the doorway of the tabernacle so that the sacrifice could be offered on the altar and burnt. That's what insulin is. And did the priests just figure out that that's what they had to do? No. God wrote it all in the book. God wrote the law for the Levite priest in the book. And God wrote your, God wrote your insulin formula in, in your DNA. So here's the question now. How does, how does DNA turn into insulin? Does it just, is it, again, is it just magic? No. God has a way. This is, get ready. Okay, here's the way that God does it. The same thing is, how does scripture verses become a believer like me? How does that happen? Because after all, the language that DNA is written in doesn't really match any language out in the world. Be closest to Hebrew. But the thing is, how many people do we know that actually read Hebrew? Very few. As far as you compare it to the world is concerned. How many, how many geneticists can actually read the, the human genome? Very few. So the thing is, how can this Hebrew Old Testament and this Greek New Testament, how can it create a saint, someone who believes God and trusts in God for eternal life? How does that happen? Here's how it happens, okay? Number one, it's called DNA transcription, and it's actually in the Bible. God told, and I'm going to try to move through some of this very quickly. God told that when they got into the land and they had a king, he shall write him a copy of this law in a book. The king was not to take the original book that was in the uh, Ark of the Covenant, that was in the most holy place. He was not to take that original. He was to write himself a copy of it, and that copy had to be dead on, had to be transcribed perfectly. But the first process is DNA transcription, and here's what happens. This thing called RNA polymerase. It's a polymer is what it is. This thing serves one function. What it does is it takes the DNA in the nucleus, the scroll of the book, and it opens it up. It unwinds it, just like Jesus. Oh, good grief. Get ready, people. It opens the book, and then it takes and makes a copy of, the, of, what, of this little section of the book, not the whole thing. It makes a copy of this little section of the whole book, and carries that. That's now called RNA because it's single strand. Once it makes a copy of this genetic code, let's say right here is the formula for insulin. Once it makes a copy of what's in the recipe book, it closes the book back up and continues on. This, R, this polymerase is going to go over here now and look for something else to make. Now get ready for this one. This whole process of DNA transcription is written in your Bible. Luke chapter 4, there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. How many, how many chapters did Isaiah have? 66. How many books are in your Bible? 66. And, there was and you know what he did? He opened the book. Why? Because he and he alone is worthy to open the book. Did you know that there is nothing else in your body that can open up your DNA and, and transcript RNA so that it can go do something. Nothing else in your body. Only RNA polymerase. It's the only thing. 
And here Jesus is the only one who can open the book. That's Revelation chapter 5. He had opened the book. He found the place where it was written. Right here, right here. He's looking for a period at the end of a sentence. He's looking, he's looking for a chapter and a verse. So he opened the book, and the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. When the RNA polymerase is going across the, the rolled-up DNA, you know what it's looking for? It's looking for a chapter and a verse and a sentence and a period. It's looking for a stop codon. That's what it's called, stop DNA. It, it, the geneticists all know this. They know how to recognize a stop codon. You'll have a, you'll have a series of AGTC or whatever. You'll have a series of it, and that same series looks like this, the one back here and the one you know four miles back that way or whatever. It's, all, it's a stop sign is what it is. It's a period. And this RNA polymerase is looking for the stop sign. It's looking for the the period and the and the next chapter and the next verse that's what it's looking for and when the rna polymerase is trying to transcribe a copy of your dna that makes insulin it does not add to it the instruction code for making a new blood cell doesn't do it it makes out only what it needs to make insulin and then it hits that stop code on, and it closes the book. And look at what Jesus did. He actually said to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, and he closed the book. And if you go back to Isaiah chapter 61, you'll see that he stopped it mid-sentence. There's a little, there's a semicolon there, I think. But the what follows to preach the acceptable year of the Lord in Isaiah 61, what follows is that, is that and um, the, uh, you know what, I got to go read it. Isaiah 61. I got to hurry up. I got to get this right. I don't want to mislead you. But you kind of understand the, the issue here. When Jesus closed the book, he closed it mid sentence and he was telling everybody, and, you know, this day is this prophecy fulfilled in your hearing, meaning I've come to do this. I've come to do this and only this right now. To, verse 2 of Isaiah 61, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, comma, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. The day of vengeance is not yet. Not yet. So when Jesus closed the book on half of Isaiah 61, verse 3, is that it? No, verse 2. When he closes the book halfway through the verse, he was acting just like RNA polymerase. He's not there to make insulin and red blood cells. He's there to do this one thing. Now he closes the book. And DNA transcription is exactly what you see in Luke chapter 4, verses 17 through 20. It is exactly that way. This, this gets me. Now, this little RNA strand here, you know what it's called? Messenger RNA. I'm not making that up. They, you know why? Because this is a part of the DNA Bible. When us preachers get up to preach, we're told to preach the Word. But none of us, I, I did this one time on a Sunday morning. I, I, I asked the Lord if he would let me preach the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation in one sermon. And God gave me leave to do it and gave me how to do it, and it was really cool. But you guys know me. When I stand up to teach or preach, I'm not going to teach you in one sermon the entire book of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I'm told to preach the word, but what I do is that I give you the word in little pieces, just like messenger RNA is. Messenger RNA does not is is not the entire genetic code. It's only for what's needed at that time. Just like you, when you open up your transcripted copy of the Word of God, God may have you read one little piece. Some people they like to read three or four chapters a day, some people ten chapters a day. And, and I, have not, I have no problem with that whatsoever, but I'm telling you that there are times when God will have you read one verse and he'll say, stop right here. I want you to think about that verse, and, I don't, and, and me and you is going to talk all day today. 
You know what that is? That is messenger RNA, where God is using it to do one specific thing in your life. And once he does that, then he's going to move on to something else in the Bible. And I love it. Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. And this is exactly DNA transcription. Once the messenger RNA is copied out of the original book, did you catch what I just said? Once the copy is made from the original manuscript, the copy has to match perfectly the original manuscript. Because the formula for insulin is right here. And if part of the words in that formula got copied incorrectly, it will make poison and kill me. There was, and I, I'm going to go a little bit late today, there was a, a very, um, they made a, actually made a movie out of a legal case that happened in Jeff Como, Jefferson County, Missouri, back about 25, 26 years ago. There was a lady that her, she had a, a baby that died. Um, it was, I don't know, about, I don't know, 10 months, 12 months, something like that. Anyway, her baby died, and the Jefferson County police thought that she had killed her own baby by feeding it um, antifreeze. And the lab that analyzed the baby's blood determined that what was in the baby's blood was the same chemical that's in antifreeze. Therefore, she's guilty. And they threw her in jail, in prison. They convicted her of murdering her own baby. Right before she went to prison, her husband and her, she was pregnant with another child. She had the baby while it was in prison. And... She was allowed visits with this baby, but she was never to be alone. Well, all of a sudden, she was alone with the baby for one visit, and then not too long after that, they took the baby to the hospital. It almost died. And they determined, they took blood samples. Sure enough, there was this chemical in there that matches the chemical that's in antifreeze. And they thought, we've got her dead to rights. She's, she's tried to kill this other baby. And she's all the time declaring her innocence. A lawyer from out of town got a hold of the case and came to help her, and he said, let me tell you something. The half-life of antifreeze in the human body is like so many hours. And the lab said that they found, they determined there was a, a tablespoon full of poison in this baby's body at the time of testing. And he said, you know what that means in, in as far as the hours and the half-life of this antifreeze? That means that when you fed this baby antifreeze, you had to have given this baby 21 gallons of antifreeze in order for there to be one tablespoon of it left in its body. He says it's not possible. It, when he introduced this new information, they, let her, they, they declared her innocent, let her out of prison. She sued everybody in the world for a ton of money and won. But you know what they found out? They found out that both of those babies had a genetic problem where part of their gene structure was actually creating methyl alcohol poison. You see how it works? This is true, people. If that word is not transcripted right, you'll die. All right? You got you to gotta look at this. I got I to gotta remove my ugly picture here. Get ready. Adam. Adam was the original manuscript. Adam had the original word of God. Adam, this is the book of the generations of Adam. It's talking about his DNA. It's talking about your Bible. And Adam had in his blood the original DNA of everybody in the world. And Adam was going to die. And before he died, he made a copy of his DNA. It's called a son in his image and after his likeness. Isn't that cool? Listen to me. Listen to me. If you took the DNA from every human being that's alive on this planet right now, 
and put it all together, you know what you've got? The exact DNA makeup of Adam, the son of God, in the Garden of Eden. Everybody that's alive, every human being that is alive on this planet right now has Adam's DNA in him. Everybody does. We all came from Adam. You know what that means? That God perfectly translated the original manuscript of Adam's DNA and preserved it from you got to read the Bible. You got to read Psalm 119. He said, You'll preserve it from generation to generation. <laughs> his Bible, his original manuscript is transcribed. He made a copy of it, gave it to Seth. Seth made a copy of it, gave it to Enos. Enos made a copy of it, gave it to Mahalalel. Noah had a copy of it. Was it not as good as the original? No, that's stupid. Because Noah, when he comes up, Noah gave it to his three sons. And when his three sons come off the ark, those three sons made 72 families in the earth. And everybody on this planet comes from one or a combination of those 72 families. Meaning that everybody has in them right now the perfectly transcribed original manuscript of who Adam was. And they're trying to tell you that only the original manuscripts were the Word of God. That's what they're trying to tell you. And see, what happened to Adam? What happened to his copy of the Word of God, DNA? What happened to it? He died, and it turned into dust, because all flesh is grass. And the grass withereth, and the flower fadeth, but the Word of our God shall stand forever. Look at that! That means that whether it's the Bible written on papyrus, which is grass, or vellum, which is animal skin, which is flesh, whether it's the Word of God written on those things as the original manuscripts or the DNA of Adam, it doesn't matter. Though Adam died and turned back into dust, and you would never be able to retrieve his DNA, if you found his burial site, you wouldn't be able to retrieve his DNA because it turned to dust. It faded away. But we're still carrying it right now. I passed it down to my children. They passed it down to my... Listen, I can see me and my grandkids. Oh, my goodness. In some places, it tickles me. In some places, I'm going, oh, my goodness. Now, watch this. Watch this. I'm going to... Hang on. I'm going to make a little... I'm going to press a little button here, and I am going to not have the music play cuz i'm going to i'm going to run through this okay watch this so here is let's say that this is an original manuscript but it's not because there are no original manuscripts adam's dead and so is paul and everything that moses wrote is gone it's disappeared everything that ezra the scribe wrote is gone it disappeared everything that paul wrote on is disappeared because after a while the 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 grass that they wrote it on, it just gets old. And it's just like old people. Pieces of them start falling off over the years. But what did we do before we got old? While our, while our bodies were still young, we made a copy of our DNA and we passed it down. But how did this become this? It was transcribed perfectly. So that's how it happened, DNA transcription, okay? Uh, let, me, let me get to this here. So this is not transcripted right. There'll be no insulin. There'll be poison in my body, okay? So how does this messenger RNA become insulin? Now we get to the second part. The first part is DNA transcription. Second part is DNA. Watch this now. This is written in Greek. The copy of the original was written in the same language. When Paul said, take this letter, Colossians, and send it to Laodicea, and then likewise get a copy of their letter and read it to the Colossians, they were making copies of it in Greek. I don't speak Greek. I don't read Greek. I don't read Hebrew. I can't. I don't know what it is. You don't have to. You don't have to. 
it's already being done for you. It's going to be translated into your language, and that's what this process is. How does this become this? First, DNA transcription, messenger RNA comes out, and then DNA translation. It goes from the code of its original language and turns into insulin. What happens is these little machines here, there's a machine, it's a very complex machine that goes across this code book, the recipe book. And as it hits, let's say this is adenine here and guanine and cytosine. As it hits this little codon, that is, let's say that's lysine. And so this machine will take a molecule of lysine and stick it in place, and then it'll read another code, and that'll say, well, that's uh, tryptophan. It'll take a molecule of tryptophan and stick it to the lysine. And what it's doing is that it's reading the code, taking the amino acids that the code is requiring, putting them together to form proteins. And everything that we eat turns to proteins. So the body is taking the things that we eat and using it to build new things. Watch this. It must be interpreted. That's what this is. DNA RNA translation. It must be translated. So look at it like this. How does a cake recipe turn into a cake? Grandma. She's the one who looks at this, gathers in, and let's, there's another part to this, I just learned it Monday, it's called a transfer RNA. Transfer RNA actually is RNA that, that brings the pieces of amino acids that it needs to make the protein insulin. Okay, picture this, grandma has the grandkids over, grandma's going to make cake, and the Kids are saying, can I help? Grandma, can I help? Yes. Susie, you get the flour. Johnny, you get the sugar. Billy, you go bring me the vanilla extract. Okay? Um, Sally, bring me the eggs. Don't, Sally, don't drop the eggs. Please don't drop the eggs. And Grandma is using the messenger RNAs, her grandkids, to bring her the raw ingredients. And Grandma is able to translate the transcripted recipe into and put the ingredients together and build the cake. I think that is absolutely amazing that our God does it that way. So here's what I'm going to leave with you. Why don't you believe that the Bible could be correctly translated when your grandmother, as simple as she is, may not have even had a high school education, and you know for a fact that your grandmother can outcook your wife every day and twice on Sundays. Your grandma had to take an old recipe that had been in her family for years make copies of it because the one she was given and when she was a girl was all tattered and she made a copy of it and she was sure to copy it right. And she kept that and preserved it. My, my Meemaw used to have it all, she used to have these recipes laying everywhere. And she would take that old recipe and she'd read it again and she'd make, oh, my grandmother made, my Meemaw made the best pecan pies that have ever been tasted by a mortal man. And I can't have them anymore because I have diabetes. How, my, how did my grandma do that? My grandma, I don't think she ever graduated high school. She grew up on a farm, married a farmer. How is she able to do that? Very simply, she knew how to take what was on the paper and turn it into pecan pie. She took the raw materials, Made it, she made her own crust from scratch, everything. Nothing was store-bought except maybe the caro syrup that she used. She was able to do that, and she was able to make the best pies I've ever had in my life. My grandmother used to make some of the best cornmeal stuffing. Oh, mm, 
mm, mm, mm. Cornbread stuffing. And if your grandma can make some of the most outstanding dishes that you've ever had in your mouth, she had to, she had to transcript and then translate properly the dish that she fed you or it wouldn't be good, would it? And if your grandma can do it, why don't you think God could do it? But he did. He promised in his word that he was going to speak to all languages. And, I, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again. I don't believe that it's just the King James Bible. There are other vernacular translations that are based upon the same text manuscript line that the King James is. Now, you might say, yeah, but ha, in those other translations, some of the words are translated differently than they would be translated in English. I got this one. When we went to Kenya, Kenyans make stew. They make stew. They take, they take beef, and they put it in a pot, and they add some vegetables, and they add some broth, and they add some spices. Kenyan stew is pretty good, but I didn't grow up on Kenyan stew. I grew up on mama stew, and my wife, my wife makes good stew, but it's different. So are people all over this world. Though we come from the same source of DNA, which is Adam, there are variations in that DNA in every place in the world. And they all have it just a little bit differently than we do. And yet, it came from the same source. Wow. Mm. You ought to just believe the Bible. You know what? You ought to... Do not interpretations belong to God. So what happened on the, on the day of Pentecost? I don't know if I have that here. Watch this. For any man speaking an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three, and let one interpret. It has to be interpreted. It has to be interpreted. And God is the interpreter. Your body has a machine that does one thing. It, and, and by the way, not everybody had the gift of interpretations. But your body has a machine in it that does one thing, and that's all it does. It interprets the genetic code and, and takes that and puts together the different amino acids to form the protein. My brother-in-law, Steve, was a welder. And just like his father, my father-in-law, Sterling, he was a welder. And Steve used to tell me my favorite thing in the world to do was fit up, which what, what that means is, is that he was given a set of plans, and Steve didn't graduate high school either, but he was given a set of plans at a, at a shop that he worked at that had how all the pieces were to be put together. And what he did was he was able to take that set of plans and take this rod and take this piece of steel, and he was to fit them together, put them in, a, in the right place, had the dimensions had to be perfect. This has to be 38 and three quarter inches. This has to be pointing this way, and this has to be level. And this, and that's what he used to do. He used to do the fit up, and then the welders would come in behind him and weld the pieces together and put it together. You see, the blueprints they require an interpretation as well. Somebody's got to read them and turn them into a house. The Holy Ghost gives the gift of interpretation of unknown tongues so that you and I can have the DNA of God, His Word, that gives us everlasting, eternal life. That's what I believe. That's what I believe. I think you ought to believe it too, but I can't help it if you don't. All right? Anyway, enjoy this. We're going to replay it probably tomorrow. We'll get it posted online. You pray for us here. God bless you. I've had more fun. I appreciate you.
Thanks for always praying for me. Keep doing it, all right, so I can keep studying, keep showing you what, what God has in this book. We'll see you later.